Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had risen from the dead. So they gave a dinner to him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself with what was put in it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for, this, for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large, the large crowd had come to the feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he, raised, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those that went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from uh, Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there, are, there, will, be my servant as, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the, fa the Father will honor him. Now is my, now is my soul troubled, and what, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said it, said it, at it as it thundered. Others said, an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from this earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Hey, well, good morning. We got a, quite a few visitors with us, and we want to welcome you, and uh, we ask that you come back uh, whenever you can. Just a full disclosure, I don't know where my preaching Bible is, and so I have to use this one. It's just not the same. 
you know? And so uh, if something's off, we'll blame it on that. How's that sound? <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's, start by, let's start by praying together. God, we love you, and we, we love what you've done for us in the person of Jesus Christ, and that's, that's why we worship your name, uh, because you have graciously set our hearts on fire for you. Um, you didn't break these bruised weeds or reeds, rather. You didn't snuff out these smoldering wicks. You, you've made us straight and set us aflame. And we praise you. And it's all because Christ, our King, who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and who will return on a white horse, loved us so much that he gave himself for us. And so we praise you, King Jesus, today. May our hosannas be praise that befits what you've done for us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, tend to this sermon and that you would break the word of life unto us. We need you desperately. We need you more than we could ever imagine. We need you more than we even know. You know what we need to hear. You know what we need to see from this text. And I pray that as I preach, you would just help me to preach what's there, that I wouldn't add anything to it, that I would see what you would have us to see, that you would confirm it to our hearts and you would apply it in our lives and you would give us strength as we depart from here to live in such a way that shows that we value Jesus Christ, our King. I pray for help, God, as I preach today. Pray that you would give me your words. Pray for those who listen. We know how active Satan is when the word is preached, when the word is read. Some of us even found our minds wandering already. I hadn't even got to the sermon. And our minds are just wondering when we hear this scripture read. We're thinking about lunch. We're thinking about dinner. We're thinking about what we have to do. Just help us. We're needy. We need your help. Help me. Help us. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as Darren mentioned, this is Palm Sunday. Next week is Easter, and um, we're walking through the Gospel of John together. We've gotten to John 9, um, so I don't want to abandon this Gospel, but we are going to skip ahead this week and next week. So this week, as you know, we are in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 33. Now, when Jesus enters Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, he does so for a reason. Anything that Jesus, everything that Jesus does, he always does for a reason. And we trust the authors of the text, these men that were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these. We, we trust that they know what they're doing. Do unto authors as you would have authors do unto you. So we want to in, in, interpret, you get it? It's like the golden rule for authors. It's pretty funny. But we want to in, interpret the text the way the author, the best we know, we know how, the author would want us to interpret it. And one of the Basic rules of biblical interpretation is when you get something in the middle of a text, like Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, you can't divorce that from what precedes it and from what follows it. If you take this event and you read it in light of what comes before it and what comes after it, you get a lot more out of it than you do just Jesus rode onto, into Jerusalem. He found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. That's pretty, you know. Yay, Jesus. He can find a donkey. So we want to get more out of it than that, all right? So this is kind of the way the sermon is set up. It's entitled, A Donkey and a White Horse. And, and what we have here in verses 1 through 8 and verses 9 through 19 are two narratives, all right, that are filled with things that are very odd. They're, they're, just, they're just strange. And then in verses 20 through 26, we have an application from verses 1 through 8 and verses 9 through 19. And then the la at last we have verses 27 through 33, 
which is a new ruler, all right? So let's just, let's just walk through this together. We're going to take verses 1 through 8, and we're going to see what is kind of odd as we, as we read it. So six days before the Passover, Jesus, therefore, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. We're going to talk about that in uh, probably two months or so. Martha served, shocker, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, and then we get the little parenthetical aside here, who was about to betray him, said, Why was this anointment not sold for 300 denarii, or literally it's 300 silver coins, and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used, to help him, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And so Jesus acts like, you know, some of us have always acted. We do a lot of stuff for ourselves or for somebody else. We do a lot of stuff for somebody else in the name of ourselves. <laughs> hey, you, should, you could have given this to the poor. Guy. Knowing good and well, he wanted to skim some off the top. And so that's the way we act. We do a lot of things for other people or in the name of other, of, of other people for ourselves. And this is what Judas has got going on here. So that's one attitude here. The attitude that says, I can do something for me in the name of doing something for somebody else. I hope you all follow that. I messed it up a few times. Jesus said, he comes to her defense, leave her alone. This is very interesting, the way this is constructed. So that she may keep it or save it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So this is what's really interesting about this. It literally says, leave her alone so that she may save it for the day of my burial. Well, she's actually done the opposite with this ointment. <laughs> She's poured it all out, and Jesus is telling Judas, hey, leave her alone so that she may save it. And so immediately you're like, this is, this is a weird way of speaking. And if you, get a, if you get different translations of this, like the NIV or um, the New King James Version, you'll see translators really wrestling what to do with what they call a henna clause, which is translated that or so that. That, that henna clause is there, and they don't know what to do with it. Because it literally says, leave her alone so that she may save it. Well, she's already used it all. That's very strange. The other thing that's strange about it is that, generally speaking, anointing someone with oil was used in occasions of gladness. And here Jesus takes it and applies it to his death. So that's the other shocking thing about it. She's poured it all out and he says, leave her alone that she may save it. And then he says, and she's done it for my burial. Okay. And then, this is more, the poor you have always, you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So even, G, even through Jesus' ministry of the church, poverty will never be completely alleviated, ever. So, that's interesting. Those are the interesting things from verses 1 through 8. Let's move to verses 9 through 19. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So this is, Lazarus is, is, is a pretty popular person. Imagine if he lived in Limestone County. I mean, we would all want to go see him, right? This guy was dead for, he was dead for three days, and he's out walking around. We'd all, we'd all flock to see Lazarus and to, and to see Jesus. And Lazarus, not only is he interesting because he was dead for three days and was raised from the dead, he is living proof that Jesus actually is all that he claims to be. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light that gives life. He who it is who believes in me will never die. 
He who it is who believes in me, even though he will die, he will live forever. And so you have all these different statements that, that show that Jesus is life-giving. And finally, for the first time, you have a person who embodies Jesus' power, his life-giving power, and you have a person who is a living testimony to the people that are going to put Jesus to death in that time, that even their plans to put him to death may not work. <laughs> this man raises people from the dead. That's why when the tomb was empty, they did everything they could to cover it up. They've seen this living testimony of a man raised from the dead by a man who has power over death. Their best hope is to kill him, and they, that may not even work. It may not work. So it's pretty neat. So, <laughs> the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And these, these, these people are in a mess. I mean, all they have is death here. And they've already seen somebody that's got power over it. The next day, <clears throat> the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. All right, this is where the next interesting thing happens here. So... They took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, or literally, God save us. Oh, God save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, this isn't the first time Jesus has been recognized as a king. If you remember in John 6... After he fed the 5,000, the people were coming by force to make him their king, and he gets out of Dodge, right? So Jesus is familiar with people recognizing his kingship. But what he does here is completely different than what he did in chapter 6. Upon hearing, Hosanna, God save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus does this. Look at verse 14. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. So these people are ready to make him king. And Jesus says, okay, I'm going to go find a donkey real quick. Which, and you read the other accounts, we know how he got the donkey. And look at verse 16. Let's skip verse 15 for just a second. And if you don't think that this is just odd, his disciples did not understand these things at first. So even they're confused. And one of the reasons they're confused is because a king who's running or riding, rather, into a city that's under a, the control of a foreign government would not pick a donkey as his mode of transportation. Because kings and messengers that rode on donkeys brought news of peace. Jesus has the wrong animal. You should be on a horse. Not a donkey. What are you? That's why the disciples are confused. Look at this guy. Jesus. King Jesus. <laughs> but Jesus is everything for a reason. He accept their, accepts their claims to be their king, but he only accepts them on biblical terms. Jesus knows the scripture. He finds a donkey to fulfill Zechariah 9.9. 9. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, setting on a donkey's colt. And if you just... Turn over the turn turn to this passage in your Old Testament and you look at the context of it. If I can find it. Let's 
because I don't have my preaching Bible. Zechariah 9.9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Look at verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. And the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. So Jesus rides in on a donkey to fulfill Zechariah 9 9 because of the context of the prophecy. The The point that Jesus makes by riding in on a donkey is, I am a king of peace. He rides into Jerusalem as the prince of peace. And nobody gets it because he's on the wrong animal. He should be on a horse. We don't need peace to overthrow this government. And so here's the application. Here's where the application comes in, verses 20 through 26. Let's back up. In verses 1 through 8, you have Judas seeking to gain something by taking. And you have Mary giving everything that she has. And Jesus says, stop, don't stop her from doing this. She's saving it. Judas tries to take by grabbing. Mary saves by giving. All right? That's the first weird thing. Here's the second weird thing. Jesus is riding into a city under foreign rule, not on a war horse, but on a peaceful donkey, an animal that signifies peace. The the Bare bones, meat, and potato application that you get from this right off the bat is is, is this. Kingdom reality is different than earthly reality. It's one of the things that we learn from Palm Sunday. The way the kingdom works is not the way the world works. The world says, I'll take from stealing. And the kingdom says, no, no, no. You save by giving. The world says, we need a king on a horse. And the kingdom says, no, you don't. You need a king on a donkey. Speak in peace. Kingdom government is not worldly government. Kingdom government is not democracy. Kingdom expansion doesn't happen the way earthly government expansion happens. And so when you get to verses 20 through 26, with all this in your head, it says, Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So the Jews have already said, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So the Jews are on board. It's a gravy train with biscuit wheels for them. Now, the issue is that Jesus, as the Davidic king, is not merely a Jewish king. He is a king that rules the nations. So, with that in mind, the next group that John introduces after the Jews are Greeks. They're Gentiles. And Jesus' response to them wanting to see him is a parable of A grain of wheat that falls to the earth and dies, yet bears much fruit. What Jesus is telling us is this. 
my rule as your king, as Hosanna, will spread, but not like the rule of earthly kingdoms spread. I will not spread my kingdom by enslaving Greeks or slaughtering Greeks. I will spread it by dying for Greeks. When I'm lifted up, I'll draw the whole world to myself. Your your vision of what it means for me to be your king is an earthly vision. I'm giving you a kingdom, spiritual vision here. And so that explains why we have this mention of Lazarus' death and Jesus' death right after Hosanna from the Jews and Greeks coming to see Jesus. He's showing us, the Palm Sunday shows us how the kingdom of Christ, our king, spreads. Not by followers taking other people's life in the name of the king, but by followers of Christ laying down their lives for others in the name of the king. But what about Judas and Mary? This is explained, I think, by verse 25. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now remember what Jesus said to Judas when he rebuked him. He says, let her alone that she may keep it. For the day of my burial. What you have with the juxtaposition of Judas and Mary are two mindsets. An earthly mindset in Judas and a spiritual mindset in Mary. The spiritual mindset in Mary takes an ointment that costs 300 silver coins and lavishes Jesus with it. And Jesus describes this giving of the ointment as her keeping it. The reason for it is, Judas, just a little bit later, will actually sell Jesus for... Ninety percent less of what Mary gave to Jesus. So you have two people in real life, in real economics. This is real money. Like you can measure how much each person values Jesus. Mary values Jesus 300 pieces of silver. Giving it to him. And Judas values him at 30. 30. That, that's the difference. That's there for a reason. To show us what it means when Jesus says, whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So not only... Is kingdom government different than earthly government? Kingdom economics is different from earthly economics. Capitalism does not drive the economic system of the kingdom. There's only one person of any value in kingdom economics, and that's King Jesus. And King Jesus is of such value... That it doesn't matter what we do, what we lose on an earthly economic perspective in the name of Jesus. We've got more than we could ever lose in the person of Jesus. It, it shifts our thinking. Palm Sunday shifts our thinking. From earthly to, to kingdom. Now. All of this happens in the context of crucifixion. Palm Sunday not only shifts our thinking in the way 
and, and challenges us to value Christ more than we value spouses, children, comfort, security, money, okay? Palm Sunday also serves as a parable of sorts to what Jesus is actually going to accomplish. This is one of the most beautiful things about John 12. It's Jesus plays out. He acts out in real time and space heavenly realities. And he knows he's going to do it. We know this because of what we read in verse 27. He says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, the hour of his death. But for this purpose, I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven and said, I've glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake, not mine. The voice that confirms what Jesus is going to do. Jesus is the grain of wheat that is going to fall to the earth and bear much fruit. This voice confirms everything Jesus has said. And he does it for their sake. Why is it for their sake? Because this voice communicates the following realities. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. In other words, what has arrived on the scene, on the stage of human events, is a new ruler. The Greeks are brought in because for him to reign over Jerusalem is much too small. Jesus is a worldwide king. Jesus, his death, when he dies, he will not only rule over the people that took the palm branches, the Jews that took the palm branches and, and laid them on the ground, that had them in their hands saying, Hosanna, save us, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is not only going to be king of those palm branch people, he's going to be king of Greek palm branch people, but they don't have any palm branches yet. In order for this to happen, the ruler of this age, Satan, will have to be defanged and dethroned. And Christ will do that on the cross. And when that happens, in the coming of the new kingdom, you will have a scene similar to John 12, verses 12 through 15, played out, except on the proper scale. So, so turn to Revelation chapter 7 with me. Turn to Revelation chapter 7 and, and, just, and just look. John writes Revelation as well. So John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, all have the same author. It's really interesting because you can see a lot of the same themes throughout all these books. But you go to Revelation chapter 7 and you look at verse 9. And it says this, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. This is, this is Jesus' rule here. Notice, every tribe, every nation, every people, every language, standing before His throne, and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and wait for it, with palm branches in their hands. Palm Sunday, as we celebrate it, is glorious. But it is but a shadow of what Jesus is going for. 
So what? The Jews have palm branches in their hands. He's not going to stop until the Greeks have them, until the Saudis have them, until the Israelis have them, until the Irish have them, until the British have them, until the Indians have them. Every nation will have a palm branch. So what? In John 12. So what? I'm too great of a king for just one nation to have these palm branches. By my death, everyone will surround my throne with a branch. And they're crying out with a loud voice. Remember what Hosanna means? God save us. They're crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation fulfilled. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming Coming out of the great tribulation, they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And I included this because it's just a little aside. When you think about serving God day and night in heaven, do you really want to go do that? Like, I mean, I want there to be golf courses in heaven. I mean, right? I mean, that's one of the reasons, like, I don't want a harp or a cloud. I don't, I, want to, I don't want to spend eternity bored to death. That sounds like hell. It doesn't sound like heaven. And so if you have that concept of, okay, great, if I live a good life here, which is a Bad concept. Jesus Christ lived the perfect life because your good life only gets you to hell. But if that's what you're thinking, if I do enough good to outweigh the bad, which is wrong, it's any other world religion, then I get to go serve this deity who's distant at best forever? Uh Uh-uh. This is what it looks like to serve God. Ready? Ready? He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more. They shall thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What it looks like to serve Jesus is to literally have Jesus serve you. Serving Jesus looks like Jesus shepherding us. And he's the kind of shepherd that gives us a life of no pain, no hunger, no disease, no drought. Anything that threatens joy is removed by our king, priest, shepherd, Jesus. He is a God worth loving. He's not here to make your life boring. He's not here to kill your joy or to keep you from having any fun or to box you in. Serving Jesus is freedom. So Jesus is a new ruler. He is a new ruler. But he's also... Once this crucifixion happens and he's glorified, going to have a new animal. Part of what it means for Jesus to be a new ruler, every nation, tug, and tribe, and people surrounding him with palm branches in their hand, is that he changes his mode of transportation from a donkey to a horse. And so you go to Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. And this is how Jesus... 
This is how Jesus will usher in and completely consummate the arrival of his kingdom completely. And it's very different from his first triumphal entry. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He will come on a horse, just not yet. And the reason the gospel is good news to everyone here is this. Today, in your life, he is riding in on a donkey. Your king is riding in on a donkey. Into the fortified city of yourself and of our selfishness and of our idolatry and of our pride. He rides into that city on a donkey, making terms of peace. And for all those who open wide the gates, the Jesus that they will know is the kingly Jesus, righteous and true, humble, riding in on a donkey because he took your death. That's the good news of the gospel is that we don't have to face Jesus on his horse. And that's the irony of John 12. The very thing they wanted, Jesus on his horse, would have annihilated them. And that's exactly how sin works. The very thing we want the most in our sin annihilates us. It lays us low. Jesus riding on a horse for crying out loud. And the most loving thing he does is show up on a donkey. And so we end with this supplication. Receive King Jesus on his donkey so you won't have to face King Jesus on his horse. Let's pray. God, we love you. We love your word. We're thankful that you don't give us the things that meet our expectations. We're thankful that you didn't bring your kingdom about according to our plans or bring our salvation about according to our plans. We're thankful for that when our stupidity, we cried, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. We're thankful, Jesus, that you found a donkey and not a horse. We're thankful that you came in to our lives as the Prince of Peace. That the sword that comes from your mouth doesn't destroy us, but rather shows us the areas that we need to surrender to you. It shows us the, the sins that we need to forsake and the Savior that we need to embrace. We're thankful for the robe that you wear that's dipped in blood, that we are clothed in robes of white. And those robes have been made white by your blood. You died our death. And by faith, we receive the life, your life that you live for us. And we thank you for that, God. Every believer in here says amen, and we thank you for that. And our prayers for those who don't believe, that they would see you as just kind and gentle and loving and merciful. As a beacon of hope. 
as a person they can trust, as a refuge to which they can run, as a safe place in which they can hide, that you will be these things and much more to us for all of our days. The shepherding that we will experience day and night in your temple. No death, no disease, no tears, no scorching sun. That the shepherding that we will realize in full, we can have now in this life. full of dangerous ravines and fast-flowing currents of water. Lord, we pray that you, we will receive you as our shepherd, our older brother, our Prince of Peace, our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, and our God. The Holy Spirit, do this for us today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.